All right, so this is the first field test of my shack in a box. Uh, there's the battery. I don't have any like decent cables to hook up to it yet, so I just quickly grabbed a pair of jumper cables. Uh, but because it's built into the same box that's already on my bike, it mounts pretty nicely on top of it. Uh, just using some 550 cord. I use some of the foam for a little bit of shock absorption and also to get some more tension on the cord. Uh, and then my right saddle, I got the ground plane, got the radials, and 50 foot coax. I don't know why I threw this in there. And a auxiliary speaker, and I'll show you the purpose of this once I get it set up. And this literally just arrived as I was leaving, so. Yeah, let me uh, get it set up real quick. So here's the shack in a box itself. I still gotta get the antenna and everything set up, but I just wanted to show you how everything's packed. I literally just got done with the 3D printed mounts today. Uh, but up top, I have a portable monitor. It's literally 15 millimeters thick. It's powered by USB-C. Uh, it can take video over USB-C, like with a MacBook, so you only need one cable. But with the Raspberry Pi, you can power it with USB-C and then send HDMI to it. Uh, this came with the case. I just use it in between to kind of keep everything firmly squished down here and squished up there. Uh, but nothing should be contacting the screen because I've measured everything out. Uh, and I even put a piece of tape laying upside down, close it, make sure it doesn't stick to the screen because that means it's touching when it closes. Uh, I have my mobile unit, the ICOM 706 Mark II. Uh, literally any kind of vehicle unit will work in this kind of case. Um, a MFJ 25 amp, they make a nicer one. It's like $50 more and it has the readout screen for the voltage and amperage. And it's 35 amp, but I really just wanted something compact, as compact as possible. I wasn't really going for cheap on this, but I was going more for the function that I needed it to meet. Um, and then this MFJ antenna tuner, uh, the model's MFJ 16010, by the way. 16010 power supply is 4125. I know these are really hard to look up because all the websites don't have very good search features. Uh, but this is a 18 to, or 1.8 to 30 megahertz. Basically 160 meter to 10 meter antenna tuner. Now this is a 100 watt radio and this is a 100 watt antenna tuner. Um, if you only had a 50 watt radio, which a lot of mobile units are 50 watts now, um, they do make a smaller one that's only does the same range, but it's just rated for 50 watts. So you might actually benefit from that more if you only have a 50 watt unit. If you have a 200 watt unit, then you definitely can't use this one. You gotta go even bigger. Um, down here, I have an old Raspberry Pi 4. Uh, this used to be my garage Raspberry Pi and it was a previous project to make a pro gamer Raspberry Pi. It's got LEDs and everything. Uh, but it's really dirty now because it was in the garage for a long time. Uh, and then I have a DAC ADC, uh, which absolutely sucks for gaming, even though that's specifically what it's meant for. So I've just, it's been sitting in my drawer for the longest time, but I actually found a use for it now. This is the Sennheiser GSX 1200, if you're curious. Uh, and then finally, have my tiny SA so I can have a waterfall on my 90s radio. All right, so here's the antenna. Uh, I originally started with a silver bullet from Wolf River Coils and I wanted to upgrade it. It was given, me, given to me by someone and the antenna was kind of broken in half. So I was gonna at least fix the antenna by a new whip. Um, and then I ended up buying this kit to upgrade that one. And I realized that since I had an antenna tuner, I didn't even need the silver bullet part anymore. And this is kind of amazing because these legs are 24 inches long. And this whip antenna is actually 24 inches long once it folds up. It's really easy to set up. It comes with, I don't actually, I don't think this kit. Yeah, this kit came with the three radials and I already had three. Um, the antenna book says that you should have radials 120 degrees apart. Uh, but when you're just quickly setting up, it's hard to get a perfect 120 degrees. And it's also hard to get the, the whole 33 feet out. And theoretically, they should be longer than 33 feet. 
Um, so now I have two sets and they can all be 60 degrees apart and I can just quickly throw them in one direction. Also, these cables versus regular speaker wire, which is the cheapest solution, um, whatever, I don't know what kind of coating it is. It's like the, it's like the kind of coating that's in the cables in your wall that makes it really easy to pull through. Uh, speaker cable, when you're pulling it across other cables, they like to grip and clump up and tangle. And this is nice because these are all just bundled together and I could just pull them apart. So this is kind of a moment of truth. This is a very old battery. I didn't test it at home. I just got done letting it charge for the past two days. Um, and it's only getting a 90 and then every time I restart the charger, it says it's only at 40%. So I don't know what's going, if it's my charger or the battery. And also there's these two main 25 amp terminals in the front. Don't mind my wiring job. That's just temporary until I get copper ones, I can solder them on. And then there's two home stereo speaker, like stab style, um, five amp rated connectors in the back that are used for all my accessories. So for the time being, I don't know if this is just a common bus bar, whatever you want to call it, that connects the front and back. Um, otherwise, I might not be able to power the monitor by just hooking up to the front side here. Um, so yeah, I'm going to connect the battery now to the power supply, see if that works. Otherwise, I can always disconnect the radio from the power supply and only use the radio. And then I just won't have the Raspberry Pi on the screen, which is fine for now until I find another solution. So as sketchy as it looks, I got it working. Uh, I really wish I brought my multimeter so I can see what the amperage draw here is just idle. That's a, this is a 35 amp hour solar battery from Harbor Freight, it's about $80. So it's not that bad of a battery compared to what a lot of people are recommending. They're showing off like, I've seen people showing off like 20 amp hour batteries. And yeah, that might get you like two hours of transmit time. But um, this old 90s radio, I think it said it draws five amps in the manual at idle. Uh, and not to mention, I have a blue LED strip and everything here that's like negligible. Um, but I did confirm, uh, these front terminals are a direct pass through to the rear terminals. However, everything on this power supply is also powered by 12 volt, uh, including the fan, which makes sense. A lot of PC fans and stuff are 12 volt. Uh, so the fan is running even though it's off. Uh, I don't know if that's good for it or not, but I guess I'll find out with time. Also, if you're a fan of just purchasing things that are pre-made uh, and you don't want to crimp the wires and everything yourself, Harbor Freight sells uh, connector cables for large scale inverters and stuff like that, which is probably what I'm going to buy just so it's all nice and pre-done and I won't have to hassle with it. That'll probably be my next purchase for this box just so I can get a, a shorter cable and a less sketchy cable because right now uh, both of these are just barely hanging on and I got a piece of gaff tape in between them as a really bad insulation. Uh, but I guess as long as nothing's sparking or getting hot, uh, it'll work at least for this quick little demonstration. Also, I forgot to mention it earlier, I don't know what the deal is there, but there's a wire grate underneath all the dirt. So I already kind of have a ground plane beneath my antenna ground plane. So should be getting good performance out here. If you don't have a antenna tuner, because they're really expensive, this is a light VNA, this is the more expensive version, but a nano VNA works just fine for HF. Um, so basically I unplugged from the radio, plugged into this, it's already pre-calibrated and saved. Uh, so I can change my capacitance. I like to see where the, I guess the SWRs, I don't know why the SWR won't save. Um, uh, I'm looking at the log mag. Hold on. So basically my 10 meters is right there at the right side of the screen. Um, set my capacitance dead center. Adjust my impedance. And that blue line is SWR. I do impedance based on SWR first. And then the big green curly line is the Smith chart. And essentially you're just getting it dead center. Um, so 
mess with the capacitance knob until you can get that green marker. I don't know if you can see it. Try to get it close, as close to po as possible to dead center. Um, up and down is the most important because up is like capacitance and down is impedance. Left or right is your, um, but that center line is your inductance. You want it to be 50 ohms. But essentially you just want that flag as close to the center as possible. Uh, and then sometimes I even go back to the impedance and mess with it again because now you can see the SWR is dropping even lower. So you just kind of go back and forth and fine tune it. So everything's as good as it's going to get. So now I'm tuned for 10 meters. Uh, your automatic antenna tuners, you literally just hear the same thing happen over like the period of a second. It's just going back and forth. Control and uh, where everything is and uh... All right, so I had to abandon 10 meters because uh, it was just completely dry. Uh, but I'm on 20 meters and I'm getting conversations out here at least. 20 meters is more local, I guess. Um, it's still too close to sunset to start dropping down into like 40 meters and 80 meters, but I might try that a little bit after sunset and then pack up and head home. I think that's about as good as it gets for 20 meters. I got my SWR on the floor down here, which is good. It's basically a one-to-one. -one. And then my Smith charts right here, dead center. So this is a perfect uh, 20 meter antenna. Granted, you will still need an antenna tuner, but right now I'm sitting at the Lima inductance. I think alpha's just no inductance at all. And then pretty much five capacitance. So it's almost a perfect 20 meter antenna without any kind of antenna tuner. Uh, at the same time, we had heavy fog. So this is a little trick I've been working on with OBS Studio using some of its audio functions that it has. It's, this isn't a very good um, example because at home I have a lot of noise problem and that's why I started doing it, but it's clear as day up here on the mountain away from all that AC interference. And uh, falls to the uh, ground. Let me see if I'm I can force it to get noise, some noise. Uh, but uh, you know, then a couple days later, it's gonna. Squatch is all the way open. Of course, there's no noise. Same thing, I guess. Uh, you can hear a little noise between be, syllables. Uh, you know, mid twenties all this week for high temperatures. And then, then uh, next week. Plug it in. So I don't know if they're classifying that as the uh, midwinter thaw or what the deal is. But, uh, you know, we've got about Not 10 inches of At home, it works wonders. Uh, it's basically just underneath the audio filters, I have a limiter, which basically limits the peaks to like negative three decibel. Um, an expander, what that does is anything below 30 decibels, it makes it quieter. Anything above 30 decibels, it'll make it louder. And then noise suppression, the light version, because you can actually set the, the center point. Um, so anything that's below 30 decibels is counted as noise and it'll suppress it. And at home, around all my computer equipment and the AC voltage and stuff like that, it's really good. It's like creepy good sometimes. As long as uh, the voice coming through is louder. As long as the voice coming through is louder than the static itself, um, it's really good at separating the two. Because the static at home ends up being about negative 30 decibels. I'm hearing an English accent and an Irish accent, so I don't know if I'm connecting or if it's a side. Um, some other things about the case. Uh, I was originally designing these 3D printed little mounting ramps to actually bolt into everything, but I figured since this is going to be partially in a vehicle and on my bike, and even though my bike's uh, vibration-free V4, um, the road causes a lot of vibration. And so I really like this Alien tape. It's cheaper than the 3M mounting tape, but it's like a... It's like a, a gel-based mounting tape or double-sided tape. 
Um, so it has a little bit of like vibration or shock absorption. You can probably see that one a little bit better. Uh, so it's basically taped or mounted to the bottom of the case with alien tape and then it's clamped to the sides. So it's got a little bit of, I don't wanna move that one. It's got a little bit of flex to it, a little bit of give. Uh, and then of course, when I have it closed, I have the foam on the screen. And then this foam is mounted underneath it for even more vibration absorption. Well, I was about to, to butt in to, to get a radio check. Uh, but it seems like everybody just monologues for like five minutes at a time and then as soon as they're signing off the other person comes back and then they just continue this conversation for another 30 minutes um, another thing another problem I ran into is I originally had one of these that was two USB-C's and the entire charging block was rated at 50 watts um, the top plug was 30 watts the bottom plug was 20 watts um, but the thing with Raspberry Pi is they like to make up their own power standards for some reason USB-C is 3 amps across the board you have 5 volt, 9 volt, 12 volt, 15 volt, 20 volt, etc, etc for whatever reason the new Raspberry Pi 5 which this isn't it it's on back order right now it uses 5 volt 5 amp which isn't a thing. No standard USB-C charger will do five volt, five amp. So I kind of had to make my own with this buck converter that I found on Amazon. And it basically takes anything from eight to 40 volts and then converts it down to five volt, five amp. So it's already forward compatible. So when my Raspberry Pi 5, 5 comes, um, it'll actually run 5 volt, 5 amp off a 12 volt supply. Because uh, the problem with that is you could just buy the official charging brick or the Canna kit uh, charging brick. And, but that's, that's AC voltage and I don't want to run an inverter and waste even more power with that and add complexity. Uh, so you can just make your own charger with a buck converter and some scotch locks that are underneath all the gaff tape just to keep it all neat. The reason I went with the original Anchor Soundcore is one, it was only $22, but I like JBL personally, and I, I have a large JBL, uh, I forget what it is, but it has an aux cord, but their smaller ones don't have aux cord inputs, so this is literally probably the smallest one with an aux cord input except for the original JBL Go or whatever it is, a little palm sized one. Um, but that one, I've heard it before, it sounds really bad. So this was only $22 and it's the perfect shape to store somewhere in the case if I want. It doesn't sound bad at all. Uh, the Soundcore 2, I think, still has an aux cable, uh, but they added more bass to it, which I don't really want for vocals anyways, and plus there's $50 instead of $22. Uh, so yeah, grab them while you can if you want an auxiliary speaker for your radio system. So I'm going to wrap up while there's still a little bit of light, uh, but I also wanted to show off my lights uh, now that it's not sunny out. Um, I got this little blue LED strip for $13. Uh, I wasn't going to do a color changing LED strip, but the one I have at home shows up on the spectrograph as these lines that wave back and forth when it's in color changing mode. Um, and when it's in static mode, it's just a bunch of nasty lines. This one seems to be doing good so far. And I like it because it's one of these cabinet under lights. Um, so the light's pointing straight down and it's not blinding you. Um, it's not only just to look cool and wherever it went. But also, I didn't want to lose my remote. Uh, so there's some really strong glow-in-the-dark paint on it. And I was hoping the blue LED would be close enough to the UV spectrum that it would charge it but it kind of doesn't. Uh, it does, but it's not nearly as strong as my LEDs at home when they're on blue. Uh, and also, uh, I don't know if you can, I can kind of see it on my screen. This is glowing filament. 
Uh, it's fluorescent orange and it's glow in the dark. Uh, when everything turns off, it's actually kind of green. So that's another reason I went with the blue LEDs. Just looks cool and it makes everything else look cool. Um, but yeah, that's everything. I uh, still haven't really messed with ham clock too much. It's mostly just there to look cool. Uh, I know it's got a lot of features, but I literally just got done with this this week and I started building it last week. Um, so yeah, that is the shack in a box. All right, I'm getting eaten alive by mosquitoes and miniature pterodactyls. So I think I'm definitely calling it quits for now, with flying in my face as I'm talking. Uh, that's the, the shack in a box. Uh, it's a project that I've had in my mind for a while and it took me about a week to complete. A little, still got some wires and stuff on the way from Amazon, still need uh, something far less janky than these jumper cables. Uh, but other than that, yeah. <laughs>